I, I admire your, your gusto. Okay, so uh, oh, let's, we'll just jump right in then. Hello, and welcome everyone to the Twin Raven Critique. Uh, my name is Jamie Keene, and uh, with me, if you'll introduce yourself, is Caro Brown. Caro Brown. And you, dear listener, have just stumbled into our little book club, where we'll take an hour's rest from our busy lives to chat about the stories we've found in books and in other places that we particularly like. Today, we step beyond the wall and into the mysterious, dangerous dark of the old kingdom, Sabriel. Garth Nix's, uh, what, uh, what would we place this genre, uh, this book, what, what genre would this be? Mm, probably dark fantasy. Dark fantasy? Probably mm-hmm. so. I, uh, I guess we'll We'll probably get to it in our discussion of the the parts and stuff, but man, uh, dark themes, dark imagery. He really comes out of the gate swinging with it in this one, doesn't he? Oh yeah, he does. Um, so a little little fun backstory. First off, I uh, I bullied you into reading this book. I really did. I was like, we're just gonna read this book. I didn't even give you uh, a chance. And this is one of those books that actually has kind of stuck with me over time. It came out in 1995, and I actually stumbled across it when I was working my way through the school library, going from A to Z. Right. And you're absolutely right about swinging out the gate because Sab. Sabriel pretty much starts with like this young woman coming across a, a child who's weeping over this dead rabbit. And she kind of distracts the girl just a little bit to go and bring the rabbit back to life and give it back to her. Yeah, I, I liked the that was such a good like moment of character building to show like a, a bit of generosity, a little cavalier with the the rules Right. Um, mm-hmm. All wrapped up in this nice little package of naivete that slowly unwraps as we go. So sh- where shall we begin? Perhaps with the blurb, we'll, we'll do the author his his due diligence of putting forth the marketing that they actually wanted before we uh, put our, our negligent spin on it. Oh, yes, absolutely. I was actually trying to find the official book blur before we started, but all I found were summaries, so that doesn't really help us. Oh, I've got the one from his website, if you want me to go from there. Oh, yeah, let's do that one. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, the, the blurb for Sabriel as written, presumably by Garth Nix, maybe his publisher. Sent to a boarding school in Ancel's Tier as a young child, Sabriel had little experience with the random power of free magic, or the dead who refused to stay dead in the old kingdom. During her final semester, uh, her father, the Abhorson, goes missing, and Sabriel knows she must enter the old kingdom to find him. She soon finds companions in Mogget, a cat whose aloof manner barely conceals its malevolent spirit, and Touchstone, a young charter mage long imprisoned by magic, now free in body but still trapped by painful memories. As the three travel deep into the Old Kingdom, threats mount on all sides, and every step brings them closer to a battle that will pit them against the true forces of life and death, and bring Sabriel face to face with her own destiny. Ooh, spooky. I love it. (laughs) Well, Well conceived. One of the things that I really liked about this book when I first read it, and it's, it's not a completely new notion right now, but it was in like the 1990s, um, was the idea of like a good necromancer, right? I, I had never stumbled across that because in lots of, you know, the fantasy genres up until that point, if you were working with necromancy, like you were you were on the evil alignment in some shape or form, right? Yes. So Very do not because touch, I had, very satanic panic. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Um, and so when I came across that, that was uh, one of the big hooks that really made me want to read the story. And Garth Nix really, like, I love his writing so much. Like, there's, it's an old time romanticism to it that even when I was rereading it for this, it still like grabbed me. I don't know if that was the same for you. Do you mean romanticism in the sense of how the characters develop and interact with one another? Or do you mean in the sense of the general tone of how things are appreciated? By the the latter. Yeah. 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 I think that's generally true. I don't have a lot of like a huge frame of reference for where that exists outside of like the classics of high fantasy, you know? So I was pleased to see it from a novel whose readership I would have guessed probably skewed maybe a little younger. Mm-hmm. It's not super YA, but it is, it, I think for the time that it was released, that's probably most of the following. I did a little a little uh, dip into meta-analysis and like looked in to see the sort of demographic that really loves this book. And it seems like uh, there was a big following in folks who were like a bad art. Our, or I say our, my my age, probably. Um, I think it was originally intended for, um, well, not that YA was like a, a big genre back in 1995 when it came out. 
Um, but it definitely would have fit the staple of, of YA of young adult fiction, just because um, one of the big uh, things about young adult fiction is it's about a teenager, right, doing like some kind of of coming of age story which you could say that about middle grade as well yeah yeah no and it was the only other book that i had really read up until then that had kind of like um really given me what's the wording i'm looking for um that had really given me like some some introspection was actually a series of middle school books that were written by tamora pierce and she was writing um at that time about um a female pretending to be a boy so she could be a knight kind of thing and all of those social interactions that she was having but to redirect myself from that rabbit trail Savriel, i I thought it was there were so many interesting concepts because first off you know we had the good necromancer right and not just any good necromancer but technically a bard right yes um and i really i really loved i really loved that you could kind of work with death in a musical sense it really added like another layer to it and then you had the the cat mogget right and Moggett really freaking sells this book, like, in so many different ways. Like, you know, the, like, the epitome of, like, the sassy cat and, the, like, I guess I could let you die, but I need fish, so please live. Yeah, uh, very true uh, cat energy. Definitely reminded me of my cat. <laughs> Probably the reason that I, for most of the book, was just frustrated for Sabriel's. I was like, man, she has to put up with this fucking thing. I'm, I'm glad my cat can't talk and isn't powerful. <laughs> <laughs> because this uh, is a headache uh, uh yeah but yeah no a very a very good characterization and like a fun character to have on the team for sure i think they did a good job mm-hmm. with the supporting cast and particularly they did a good job in the the supporting cast is not stacked you know it's not like a crazy mm-hmm. like broad cast for this very like narrow and focused story um mm-hmm. but they don't steal the limelight which is great because the the whole fun of this story is like watching her uh the, the main character sabriel sort of come into her own in this sort of hereditary role that that is of the utmost importance you know that she maybe doesn't want to mm-hmm. have and definitely doesn't have any experience doing yeah they 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 very much suck it, it's a uh, the the part that i really enjoyed the departure from like typical hero's journey-esque story is that um her mentors are kind of like absentee basically all of them mm-hmm. uh, and she really mm-hmm. has to like pick things up on the fly uh and her her superpower if you will really besides the fact that she inherited these bells and is generally competent it's just that she has good judgment and she she like learns really quickly you know which is great yeah yeah no i really like the good judgment thing and i i say that because there's so many like young adult books and that that have a a protagonist who's who's honestly really daft right like that always drives me nuts when it's like a when it's just like this clueless character that that's just bumbling around into things. And I know some people really like that. But for me, it's like it's really overdone. But here we have Sabriel who, you know, went to school. Right. And she technically kind of went to school on both sides. She spent one. T- so there. So just for the reference of anybody listening within this magical world, which is OK in the world building in this, it, it's really good. And I, I really appreciate how. Mr. Nix like ended up like expanding it and not the other books, but um, there's there's actually two lands in this in this world building and there's a wall that separates them. And the reason there's a wall is because on one side is where magic thrives and on the other side is where science thrives, right? And if one tries to cross over into the other, it just doesn't work, right? I don't think it was in this book, but it was in a later book, and it's not like a big spoiler or anything, but there was like this city boy that went into the magical kingdom, right? And his clothes started to disintegrate because they oh. were all made by science. <laughs> that, that heretical science, not going to work in the yeah. lands of the, the, yeah. char- the and, great charter stone. Yeah, not, yeah. And then like people who tried to cast magic in like the land of science were like expecting boom, big booms and got like a fizzle, right? Like it was, it was stuff like that. Um, and it was the first time I had really seen that. And this was also my first experience with what I would re- uh, what I would call a hard magic system, right? Because there were rules, right? Definitely. Like, for example, each of the bells, yeah, each of the bells have a certain purpose. Um, and there's, uh, there's gates that you can go through. And once you get through certain, you're kind of SOL at that point when you're uh, in the land of the dead. And like, it was, oh, it was just so good. I really like that so much. I, I just the magic system so much and the way that actually music was was woven into it yes uh the hard magic system is definitely like one of the real highlights of this book i think if we're talking about reasons why someone might like it uh if you're listening and you're thinking 
you know, what what is it in particular about this book that helps it to stand out from the the million and one books that have come out that are similar to it or like this adjacent? The the unique factor here and something that I was able to appreciate was the the sort of unique spin that he was able to put on a hard magic system that really leaned into the importance of identity, like like knowing what things are specifically and how they will react with other things. It's cool and it's interesting that the setting is this kind of like dichotomy between hard magic and then like typical empirical science uh, because the magic actually resembles empirical science sometimes in that you have these sort of ideogram charter marks that are basically just like it's it's a glyph that translates to a specific function and and you memorize a bunch of them like you would if you were learning like the the chinese uh han simplified alphabet and Mm -hmm. each of them has like a very defined very specific function and like each of the bells has a name and represents a very specific function and every place you go has a very specific property it's definitely not one of those places where you can just like wander around and you know wave your hand willy-nilly and something magical will happen you really need to have studied up and know exactly what you're doing to have any hope of surviving in this world which is a lot of fun for people who uh, are willing to take the time necessary to wrap their heads around this and one thing i will say that i really appreciate also about the the tact that nix takes in his approach to establishing all this is that he doesn't lean on like these big exposition like here's how it works and this is the way that you know you have to know this charter and this thing and this thing he does a bit with the bells when he's like first listing the bells but he only does that once and the rest of the time Mm -hmm. the story's exposition is so well done and like well paced and and grounded with the perspective of the main character uh that you really don't get any of that If she knows about something, it's because she already knows about it. And if she doesn't know about something, which happens a lot, she has to sort of like figure it out on the fly. There is no, Mm -hmm. like Moggett is definitely not there to like help her understand like, oh, this is, this is, oh, we've encountered this thing. Here's what you'll need to do. You know, he's more just like, well, you know, you might die, but I can't tell you what this thing does because I'm, I can't. (laughs) And it's like, okay, great. Thank you. Um, oh yeah that that was like a fun thing because there was like something in the charter magic where um there was a touchstone in him when they were trying to actually talk to sabriel about something they tried to both talk about and then they both started choking yeah but they couldn't say it they literally could not say it which that was actually one of my favorite moments in the story is that scene but for a different reason but Mm -hmm. uh anyway uh very cool uh magic system very cool world building a lot of effort put into it very clearly like one of one of the main selling points i would say one of three main selling points for this one yeah well you um you talked about the charter magic in there and one thing that i thought was really good kind of culturally and magically that was going on within the book is that you had to be baptized by the charter right if you were born on one side of the wall kind of thing yeah and uh, one of the interesting uh, little customs that they have is that when you meet somebody for the first time, you both actually touch the charter mark that's on your forehead. And that's how they can kind of see what your bond with the charter is. And um, they only did it kind of very lightly, but that was actually one of the big telling points um, when Sabriel first met Touchstone to know that he wasn't just like, you know, and by the way, spoilers ahead, tread with caution kind of moment here. But when she first encountered Touchstone, you know, he was he was, you know, frozen in time, so to speak, but she knew he was alive because of the charter mark on his forehead. Right. Yeah. I don't think that's too spoilery. That's in the blurb. Yeah. Well, you know, (laughs) I just like to, people get kind of weird about spoilers. How dare you? You know, like if the book's been, I know like Moby Dick, right? Like Moby Dick's been out for a while. I want to let you know he's trying to kill a whale. Like, oh my God, spoiler. Like, (laughs) (laughs) But what's the whale's name? Yeah. It's cool how everything is reliable in the way that, uh you expect it to be up until the point that it gets broken and the second it breaks then all of a sudden it's not reliable like the mm-hmm. the, the the fucking paper wing <laughs> they're like the travel system how it's like finicky and it does whatever it wants yeah have you noticed that, like anytime they try to actually do something with mm-hmm. magic it's not it's so okay so we usually when people talk about magic systems and stuff like that and they're trying to cast magic 
there's already like the complexity of trying to cast the spell, right? But then your spell has a personality, right? Like these paper wings are like, I don't want to fly at night. Like, screw you, I'm landing. Which again is like, it, it's very bard-esque, you know, it's less, uh, I just like the idea of everything being wrapped up in either music or imagery or personalities captured and, and put to purpose for a specific function, which is great. It's like a very fun, very unique sort of way to play with. Once you learn that toolkit, it's like one of the things you'll appreciate the most as the story unfolds is like looking for mm-hmm. how things. And I found myself constantly like uh, sort of being in a position of like, surely this is the right time to use, you know, X tool. Like, hey, the way that bell was described sure does sound like it'd be a great fit in this situation. Why don't, why don't you do why don't you do that? You've got the spell slots. Just do it. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Never came to that, though. So, okay. So beyond world building, anything in particular about the book theme wise that that you'd say you particularly liked? You know, I really appreciated this book's approach to death. And the reason I say that isn't because I'm morbid, but it because a lot of times when people want to talk about death, in, in some kind of form or literature, very often, I won't say always because there's always a contrary and lurking in the shadows to say, uh-uh, um, but a lot of places and fables and stuff like to depict as like a very evil thing, right? And not only was like this book's approach to it that it was just a phase, right? Like it just happens. And when it happens, just, you know, that's just the way it is. And there was also kind of like a subtle, like, you know, respect death um, thing that was going on as well. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, Anita Blake books in the sense that because she was an animator and she, she would raise the dead and then, but she would also get really um, upset if people did like um, animations like incorrectly. Like she's like, you're hurting the the soul that's in this body right now kind of thing. And that was, that was kind of helping. That was, you know, excuse my verbiage. Um, that was happening a little bit in this book as well. So if for some reason your soul got into death and it went past a certain point, um, you know, any of the necromancers, they were kind of like, you've already too far gone. If I try to bring you back, you'll come back warped right because the the river the because death is depicted as a river in here um has like eroded you too much right or um there was a couple of places where there were um monsters that are in death right and those are the souls that we would found some way to cling on and in their determination to not die uh, that would warp them as well and sometimes they would like feed off of other things that wandered into death or um, they would just somehow grow in power and i thought i was so intrigued by that i really i really like that idea that um the harder that you try to fight against the thing that's natural and should happen like the more monstrous that you become you know what i mean yeah and they did a good job, I'll say, of like making, especially like the greater dead, uh, seem particularly like dangerous, you know, and like obviously what they were going with, with even like the heretical t- uh, title is like they're abhorrent, you know, they're like mm-hmm. a very bad, very like unnatural thing to sort of have existing. And there's really not much you can do to have them not exist besides just like binding them. You know, they're, they're just sort of ever present. You'll always have to deal with them, which mm-hmm. sucks. That's the worst kind of adversary that you can't just one and done, you know, you gotta, you gotta maintain it. But yeah, I guess that that is the, the, the true um, essence of horror. Um, there, was, um, there was one more thing about this book that I actually really liked and it was um and so and it was the fact that the the answer to their salvation was in a was in a child the reason why i really like that is because you know over time fables you, fables were made for reasons right to teach us lessons as small children that we could take as we grew up you know so for example don't you know uh, be kind to strangers but don't like follow them into like a cauldron you know and all that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah do not trust um, people in the woods with candy Yes, exactly. Um, and, you know, fables d- it really kind of depend on location and what's going on at the time. Well, like I coding, so coding important my... things that might otherwise be uh, diluted by like people with agendas into very base lore. I feel like it is what that's about. And there's a little bit of that, mm. I feel like, in, in Eastern storytelling as well, where they always like put a lot of emphasis on like children's songs and children's stories and things like that, because it's like you've taken something that you're afraid is going to be forgotten, that it's like a particularly potent lesson, but it will either be forgotten or suppressed in some way. So you sort of code it into the most harmless thing you can think of that will stick with everyone. And then mm-hmm. when the time is right, someone will put two and two together. <laughs> that 
oh, I see. This this is actually quite important, and that's meant to be taken in a certain way, literally, in this case. Yeah, yeah, that was that was such a powerful element for me. And I, I say that both as somebody who likes to read and enjoys fables uh, quite a great deal. So stumbling across that uh, made me super happy. And one of the big reasons I wanted to push this book onto you is because it had so many bard themes in it. And I know you like bard stuff so much. I know, I, I definitely, like it took me a second to get there because I was trying to view the book through a different lens. Uh, and I was not thinking not thinking in terms of like how this is so similar to all the things that i like in terms of like magic being tied to storytelling and things like that um or or music or identity or or anything like that but then it all clicked eventually i think it was like while the uh while the bell explanation was happening and i was like oh they're instruments oh that's cool and then i, I was like i okay okay uh, i'm there i get it i like it the parts of the book that i liked uh, first thing i'll say is that the theme that i picked up on that i was maybe the most pleased with after i'd sort of id'd it and was following it and like looking for it was the theme of persistence the idea mm -hmm. that yeah, yeah. like he does a really good job the author does an ex exceptionally good job of like like i said that the perspective is very grounded just from from like the perspective of this one main character right you're really seeing everything through this lens of exactly how she's feeling uh, and the author does a really good job of letting us know all the different ways in which she's feeling insecure or anxious or fearful or uncertain at any given point, if there's like a reason that she should, which there are plenty because she's in an unknown dangerous place doing an, like a difficult thing. And so uh, he articulates a lot this idea of like, well, she doesn't, she sort of starts off not having a ton of context, not really knowing very much, not having anyone that she can reliably count on for support some characters are actively prevented from giving her any sort of helpful exposition <laughs> so mm -hmm. you don't have to try hard to understand why she repeatedly like has these moments of frustration or reticence to go on but then he always again in those same like moments basically the next sentence will explain how she works through it why she decides to buck up and just carry on and that those those little snippets contribute to an arc of character growth where she turns into this like very practical very persistent very competent person and then the other thing i liked about it is again this idea of like restraint uh one thing that i think is really interesting about the way that she has to conduct herself because usually when i'm thinking of like special unique people with powers the the trick is to basically bust them out as quickly as you can to like ram your way through every problem possible but mm -hmm. she is very thoughtful about when she is going to resort to certain things or there's there's a moment where she, you know or maybe a few moments where she's like well i would like very much to just pass into death and deal with this thing in this way right now and then she'll think better of it and she'll say uh oh, but that will you know make me vulnerable like it did that time before maybe i shouldn't have this grander objective that i sort of need to forego this this momentary impulse to improve my odds of success in the overarching mission and you see that a lot you see that also in her social interactions where she's like you hear the internal you know monologue of her like really like losing patience with some of the people she's with and she's like i really would just like uh, i would like to tell this person how i feel you know and you can tell that she's like bottling it up a little bit and then instead of doing something irresponsible she just will like say say something a little more diplomatic and like set the impulse off to the side which seeing these like exercises of restraint from a protagonist is like such a refreshing change of pace and i guess it owes to the fact that the book is is sort of older but yeah such things are nigh unheard of mm -hmm. i think some of that also because when she's having those moments she would actually think about uh you know, lady etiquette when she was at her school, right across the other side of the wall, uh, where they did lessons about how to deal with like difficult situations, right down to like count to 10 and think about it again, kind of. Thing. <laughs> and I, I thought that was actually really funny. She's doing the Mark Twain method. She, 
she would write uh, her her angry, scathing letters and put them up on the the internal mental mantelpiece uh, mm-hmm. for for three days before she sent them, which I really appreciate because most people just come right out of the gate these days. So yeah, Sabriel was definitely. I want to say that Sabriel was was mentally a little bit older um, than some folks would find with this genre, and I want to not really attest that more to. I mean, it is part of her demeanor, but it's also the fact of like she's grown up in this this family of abhorsons, right? So there's a responsibility that when like her father passes away, then she's the one that's going to end up being responsible for putting these wayward dead back down to the final rest. And uh, there's definitely like a part where she talked about how she's gone into death before. And so like for you to actually go into death, it's not kind of like, you know, I feel like putting on pink shoes kind of thing. There's a there's definitely a, a, de- a determined will and intention when you go in there, right? And on top of that, with the way that the book has it set up, is that you have to have a different kind of fortitude or the river is going to sweep you away, right? I want to say a little bit of the training that she did with her father prior to the book starting um, kind of assisted with some of like that, uh, that steadfastness that she had in tough situations. But it definitely didn't prepare her for a lot of things. Like I really did enjoy the moments where she was just completely freaking out and then trying <laughs> to like make it work at the end. Yeah. Oh, so I guess on that point, favorite moments. Do you have a scene that stands out for you? Oh, man. You know, if I had to pick one, it's probably going to be when Touchstone and Moggit are talking for the first time. Mm -hmm. And Moggit calls him Touchstone. He's like, that's a fool's name. And he's like, but you are a fool. And he was like, fair enough. Yeah. I liked that he didn't argue at all. He was like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Fair enough. You called me out. Um, Yeah. Fun, fun side fact about him, because uh, he in the book, he he likes to wear a kilt. And I don't know if you want to read the rest of them, but this isn't a major spoiler. But he's trying to bring back the kilt in all of the books and everybody's just not happy. <laughs> oh, he's trying to re-modernize it after like centuries of it being out of fashion. Yeah, yeah. He's just trying to. Yeah, he's trying to bring it back. Right. I see. Like, I see. And I, and, and he has kids later and he's trying to get his kids in on it. And they're kind of like, no, they're like, dad, I don't know about this. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's good. Uh, but that's yeah, a, that, that's such a fun character quirk for him. But what about you? What was your favorite moment? So I had two that, that really came to mind. One, oddly enough, the prologue uh, of this book was almost paradoxically like good and useful. Usually I feel like the prologue is like a, cr- a crutch most of the time. <laughs> to do Mm -hmm. to to set up like consistent tone and do some world building activities so you don't have to do it when you're trying to introduce the protagonist um Mm -hmm. but in this one uh there was not a moment wasted it did a great job of doing those things where it set up this kind of grim adjacent mystery dark magic tone of the setting uh but it also introduced the basically the two pivotal characters of the story in, in after a fashion um their mm-hmm. circumstances and their unique abilities it's like one two three right off the bat you understand everything you need to know um and then the rest of the time uh that's like the most that you get in terms of like having having a frame of reference to contextualize the rest of the mystery that's going on Mm -hmm. so that was really cool i I appreciated uh how that fit into the overall style and structure i think my favorite like payoff moment is maybe right after uh the scene that you're talking about where it's where the two of them they're they're like both sort of talking over each other maga and touchstone uh where they're like sort of hemming and hawing going back and forth they're like oh that that'll be a problem oh yes that will be a problem and they're they're sort of like talking to one another and she finally is like had enough she loses her patience uh, and sabriel it, it just like tells him for the first time she's like okay both of you need to figure out how to start being useful to me because you're not <laughs> you're yeah, dead i she, remember like, that I loved that the inflection point of the story was basically her learning to call out dead weight where she sees it and start maneuvering her companions into becoming more useful, uh, which is so good. You know, it just is like such a great like payoff because it's honestly it's what I've been wanting for her the entire time where I was like, man, give this fucking cat a piece of your mind. (laughs) Like it's, it's being deliberately vague, like call it out. And then finally it happened yeah. and I was like, excellent, excellent. And I feel like the the lesson there is if your team is letting you down, you need to tell them so. Or uh, Yeah, don't don't be held hostage by your manners. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. So uh really enjoyed that. Uh th- those were my those were my two picks. 
for moments. There's there's a fun history with Mogget, right? And Mogget. So here, the fun dynamic between the Abhorsons and Mogget is that Mogget wants the Abhorsons to basically like die so he can be free, right? right? So it's not it's not even in his interest to help them, but they've got like a spell on him that forces like his cooperation with the family, right? And um, the spell has to be renewed. Right. And if the spell's not renewed, the incantation starts to wear off and Mogget starts to do Mogget things. Right. Right. Which and happens. You don't. Yeah. Well, you don't really see that um, in this particular book. Um, but there's another book where like this family basically like neglected their duties for like a really long time. Right. And Mogget started doing Mogget things. <laughs> And one of the things Mogget did was that he just started to release like uh, free magic creatures out into the world. And then was like, let's go raid the city. Right. And by the time they finally got a hold of Mogget, it was too late. He had already damaged the place. Yeah. And he was like, I'm so sorry for what I did while I was hungry kind of excuse. <laughs> He's such a jerk. A jerk cat. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about him last night when my cat was like traipsing over my head. Uh Every time I, I toss and turn, she like r like walks directly over the top of me and like goes and parks in my face. Yeah, uh, yeah, true. like my yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I I like to think that Mr. Nix owns a cat because he totally gets like the the cat mentality. Oh, he certainly, <laughs> like, yeah, without a doubt, he must. Okay, so the moment of truth. Would we recommend this book? Yes, I I would recommend it because I, I just found the storytelling to be really good. Now, I will also say that this was written in 1995 and it is geared towards young adults. So for anybody who's looking for like that, I don't know what you want to call it, that highbrow style of writing, that, that vernacular that you're looking for may not be present, but I would like, but a lot of the, the thoughts are definitely there and, and subtle uh, weaving into the story. So yeah, totally recommended by me. All right. Uh, I think I recommend this book on three counts, and I caution people on one count. So here we go. First, okay. very cool setting. Uh, at least three different types of like hard magic included in the overall magic system, which is pretty cool. So if you're the sort of person who has fun wrapping your head around those sort of things and like having it all rolled out to you in a sensible way where you can kind of like piece things together as a puzzle as you go, it's a lot of fun for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, mystery and perspective are both done really well. So if you're annoyed by big exposition dumps every other chapter explaining why everything is the way it is, uh, then you don't have to worry about that. Uh, which I think is great. You get to experience all the information uh, being fed to you only through the lens of the main character's own exploration, which is great. Third, good thing, uh, character development, very enjoyable. You start from a very like relatable point, so you don't have to go through that unfortunate hurdle of like pretending to enjoy a character until they become relatable. She just starts as a, a, a dorm assistant at her college. So it's not hard. The entertain the most entertaining parts of the story uh, for me are definitely the bits where she is learning to be an, an effective leader uh, or learning how to be judicious in the impact in the applications of her very specific abhorson related bardic magics uh, mm -hmm. and, and figuring out how to advance through uncertainty and danger uh, in an effective way. So good, good for all those reasons. Uh, the one caution I would give is that the book does spend an amount of time trying to demonstrate how dangerous and hostile the environment of the old kingdom is um or how it, how it's become in the absence of, of the abhorson but that danger is mostly faced by sabriel alone because it's all happening in like act one to mid act two of a book with multiple stories and the book basically comes out of the gate by saying that if she fails the dead remain unbound forever and everything goes to shit forever. While that would be cool to explore, I, I was not persuaded at any point that that outcome was really in the cards. <laughs> so there, w there was all oh, yeah, this the, like time. It would be like, there. yeah, there would be like big five minute, like big evil, scary chase scene. And not for a moment was I in any way in like tense or in suspense or worried. I was like, okay, all right. What, what comes next when this thing is done chasing her? She's going to be fine. Uh, which <laughs> may, maybe makes me a bad dad, but, uh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't persuaded that the danger was particularly real when it was being faced by her. And that's mostly just because there weren't other characters around at that point, but that's about it. So honestly, I would say, yeah, definitely firmly in the camp of like, this is a good book. There's really only one or two chewy parts that you'll need to mull through. I'm glad that you, 
book. I really just did throw it at you because I really thought you would enjoy the concept of it. Oh, yeah. So thank you very much for humoring me. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad you so did. So now it is my turn, though, to humor you. Yes. Well, I think uh, humoring me, well, we'll see. I mean, maybe you'll be doing that because uh, I think my, my pick for next is going to be Dune by Frank Herbert, uh, oh, okay. which, of course, is, is a big old leap in the in the direction of that that highbrow vernacular that we were talking about we're going to be uh delving into the effects of drugs on the mind and the expansion of human <laughs> consciousness and uh the, the manipulation of societies through the founding of false religions which uh is is exactly my bag i'm super stoked for it <laughs> All right, so I'll reread that again, and then we can go ahead and uh, discuss that. And then uh, we haven't really told viewers or listeners how often we're going to do this, and we're aiming for for biweekly or bimonthly. I'm thinking, yeah, biweekly to start would be great. We should we should shoot for the stars, and we'll see what I'm actually able to to pull off because I'm such a slacker. But uh, oh, yeah, I think you I, are not a slacker. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I'm thinking uh, we shoot for recording not this coming week but the next week and uh try and okay. try and feed the people their their routine slop <laughs> they'll like it a lot of the people who actually do come to this channel are really intellectuals who enjoy a good read i'd be surprised if some of them haven't read sabriel but if you guys haven't um you know pick it up and then let us know what you guys thought about it because i mean it i it's a good book, and I usually like to know if other people liked it too. So, yeah, all right, perfect. I, I, I want to hear. I, I would love to see, like, when you get <laughs> when it goes up. I'll be watching the comments to see if there's like a true contrarian in the mix who like has this. Like, oh, I hope there is. Yeah, but I really I, it, do. I, I, like, listen, I know some... guys. I want it to be good. Okay, I I want to see like a really like well thought out and well articulated like scathing. <laughs> <laughs> review just just to see just to see what's going on in your mind do it give us your best yeah but not because we want to challenge you but because uh well we're both actually intellectuals in the sense that when we when we talk and we describe something we don't just have like our point of view and reject all of them we do like review counter views and, and discuss them and stuff like that so i mean it's like it's that strange thing they taught us in college. It's very <laughs> odd. Yeah, someone out here is going to have a differing opinion, and I bet it's going to be fascinating. So uh, please, by yeah. all means. All right, perfect. Well, that's going to be us for today. Thank you guys for coming and spending a little bit of time with us, and I hope that you all have a good one. And I'll let you we'll see you next time. That a little bit. Alrighty. See you next time. All right.